Hello again and welcome to danandmatt.com for this, the seventh session in our series of 10 sales and marketing presentations. Tonight, Matt, we're looking at demystifying the sales process. And I find that it's interesting that a lot of people say things like, oh, great salespeople are born or they're, they're you know, gifted with the, uh, the gift of the gab. Uh, so they're not really taught. They're just, it's a freak of nature. What are your thoughts on that? It's funny that you say that, Daniel. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm generally surprised with people saying that because they, they constantly say that they're not, perhaps not born to be a salesperson, yet they spend hours and hours chasing prospective clients, writing in-depth proposals, following up on those clients, and I guess continually making phone calls to those people, only to have those customers ripped away from them by other products and services that in many cases aren't better and aren't cheaper. Mm. And they tend, to put that, they tend to put that failure down to the fact that they weren't born to be a salesperson or they just don't have the gift of the gap. And look, that always surprises me. I mean, I, I find it ridiculous because if you can imagine a person going to neurosurgery for the first time and with no training and no skill sets, no processes to follow, trying to perform brain surgery, You'd be shocked. I mean, so many things could possibly go wrong. And to have that person walk out of the surgery and go, you know what, maybe I just wasn't born to be a neurosurgeon or I just lack the dexterity to be a neurosurgeon, that everybody would say straight off the bat, no, you're just missing the training. You need to spend five years at school to learn to be a neurosurgeon, learn the strategies, learn the steps before you step out and actually do that for yourself. But then when it comes to sales, or marketing for that matter, people just walk out and go, I know how to be a, I know how to be a doctor, I know how to be a plumber, I'm going to just be able to sell straight off the bat, just like that. And it shocks me because sales, just like any other profession, just like any other skill set, is learnt, practised, mastered and applied. And what we need to constantly focus on is being able to do that in this genre or, or, or this skill set, just like any other. Mm. So it's fair to say then that you weren't born a natural salesperson? Not at all. I mean, for me, I, I look, I started off as a door-to-door salesperson selling telecommunications. I worked business to business. And, I mean, it took me 93 doors before my first sale. And that's a lot of walking into businesses and getting rejected. And I think for me, I, I think I, I failed. I, I, I was quite introverted, I, quite shy when I was starting off. So as a consequence, I didn't just have that natural born gift, if you like. So a lot of people, and I found a lot of people that I learned to sell more than in the future, they were the ones that walked out. They could naturally talk to people. And as a consequence, they had some customers that would listen and succeeded quicker than I did. However, by learning the strategies, the skill sets, and constantly trying to improve the process, as an introverted person or as an analytical person, I constantly just looked at it as the process. I think if I had been emotionally invested, Daniel, I might have struggled because then people were rejecting me. Yeah. And I mean, that can be a little bit like dating for the first time or, or, or that sort of thing. It, can become, it becomes personal. Right. But I continued to look at it like a process. Yes. And I continued to go through the steps in that process mm-hmm. to get the desired outcome. And as a consequence, my sales process got better and better because I just kept improving. I looked at the elements that worked and I added to those. I looked at the elements that didn't work and I took those out. And as a consequence, I got so much better that within a short period of time, just a few months, I was national number one salesperson right across the board for the largest sales and marketing company in Australia. I also um, was promoted heavily. I mean, I ended up the state manager of the second, uh, the second largest telecommunications company in Australia and the largest one um, in the Southern Hemisphere, their major supply partner, just because I developed a strategy and a system that was highly successful, I began, to, I began to be able to teach it to other people. So if you ask me whether it was a natural ability, I can say definitely not. Mm. If, you, if you ask me whether or not I'm grateful that it wasn't a natural ability, 100% I am, because it allowed me to develop the skill set to make it easier for non-naturals to learn. So let me just clarify this in my own mind. Where exactly did things turn around for you? What was that moment of clarity where you knew, right, something's going to change here? Okay, well, for me, I was 
for me, I, I, I struggled always with, with learning and getting concepts. I, I was really good at repetition. Right. Right? So what I focused on was constantly repeating what I did. And when I noticed something didn't work, I took it out. When I noticed something did work, I left it in and kept repeating it. And as a consequence of repeating it, it's just like telling a story when you're talking to your friends. Yes. As you tell it more and more, you get better and better at teaching it and, or telling it. And as you start to tell it more and more, you start to realize what works really well and you really work those concepts. And if people don't identify with certain parts of the story, you take it out. Once I realized you could do that exactly the same way in the sales process, mm -hmm. that was the aha moment for me. Right. And I realized it's now a possibility. People seem to think that sales is an art form. You're either an artist in sales, i.e. born to be a salesperson, or you're not an artist in sales, i.e should walk away and let that to the naturals. Yeah. And I so disagree with that because I know I wasn't a natural and I know unless I put in the time, again, going back to the neurosurgeon analogy, like they put in the time, right, you don't develop that sales dexterity. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're telling us is that it's a totally learned skill. It, look, I can say that there are people that are naturally better at starting the sales process than others. You can just like I'm sure the first day at university, there are some people that are naturally better. Mm. However, over time, the people that put in the work are the people that succeed, yes. and the people that focus on processes and systems are always the ones that come up trumps. I mean, there are many people that make hamburgers, right? But McDonald's was the one that came through because they focused on process, procedure, and system. Now I can pick a hundred thousand different industries. And yet that always is going to be the same. Yeah. Focusing on process and systems is successful. And they've got that, let's face it, again, we all know who McDonald's are, the Golden Arches. They've got that amazing consistency that, to their credit, you can walk into a McDonald's virtually anywhere in the world and you know what you're getting for that purchase. Definitely, and that's exactly right. And what we're going to be covering off on the next session is how to make that happen in sales. And a lot of people tell me that's not possible, but there is. I've worked with hundreds of industries, thousands of clients, and every single time when somebody says it's not possible, we find it possible, and not only do we find it possible, their sales skyrocket, mm -hmm. just because what we need to do is systemize it just like every other part of their business. So I'm almost, I think, I, I think I've got the answer before I ask the question, but so what's the greatest thing that people struggle with? Is it lack of system? Well, what, it's not lack of, well, it is lack of system, but what I tend to find is people tend to spend most of their time focusing on secondary systems. Mm -hmm. People tend to say, oh, my CRM system has to be spot on. My product has to be spot on. My compliance has to be spot on. The, the product delivery, the service has to be spot on. And they focus on all these secondary systems, but what seems to get neglected is the primary reason for a business success or failure, and that is the sales, yeah. right? The, the marketing, of course, which we've discussed at length, but also the sales. And why and, is that then? Why well, is that? I think it's largely because within sales, there's a stigma towards it. People think that they have to be manipulative, or pressure people into doing something they potentially don't want to do. And as a consequence, it's become a little bit of a dirty word. Yeah. If people say they're a salesperson, if you say, I work in electric, the electricity industry, oh, what do you do? I'm a salesperson. Oh, well, I, my electricity is fine. It's, they almost feel like they have to defend the reason why they're a salesperson. It's uncomfortable. Right. And there, there shouldn't be a stigma in my view. For yeah. me, if done correctly, right, you just follow through six milestones. I mean, um, I mean, Daniel, we've spoken a few times and you actually told me that sales is about... It's, it's about serving people. And in fact, it's interesting you mentioned that because that wasn't just a personal perception that I have about what a good salesperson does. Uh, it's a little bit of trivia here, but the word selling is actually derived from the word sillus, which means to serve. So taking that, taking that concept... Why is it all of a sudden we've gone from I'm here to serve you to I'm here to pressure and manipulate you into making a decision? See, to me, those concepts aren't related, mm. right? And when we look at marketing, yes, definitely, it helps to know that we have a product that a market, a part of a market, really wants. And sales is about delivering that. So sales gets a lot easier if the marketing is right. Yes. However, sales is about building rapport, 
introducing a product, talking about an agenda, identifying a need, relating that need or, or, or relating the features of your product to the benefits for that customer, telling them some stories about some people you've worked with in the past that had that same need or want, okay, or that same pain that you really helped and it changed it for them. And then asking the customer to take the next step. To me, it's really that simple. And if we look at it from a volleyball analogy, because I know, Daniel, you're quite a fan of volleyball. No, it's so, a great sport. So what I want to do is I want to use a you know, conceptual understanding that people can get. So tell me about volleyball, Daniel. Tell me the importance. When you've got a group of yeah. players, what's the role of, once the ball goes over the net? What's the, what's the format before they obviously do the spike at the end yeah. that gets them to, to go? To and I, I'm pretty sure I know where you're going with this. So for, for those of you that have watched volleyball, obviously, ultimately, the point is, the point of the game is to get the ball away from the opposition, but unlike tennis or table tennis, the net is so high that strategically you've got to raise the level of the ball high so then you can, uh, then you can apply the final powerful thrust. So perhaps there's some analogy there that before we can sell the product, we've got to raise interest. Daniel, that's exactly right. When we look at the volleyball analogy, mm. it's a team sport that focuses on getting the ball from the initial stage and constantly hitting it up to a point where it's high enough for a team member to spike it down. Okay, and what we're really trying to do in sales, if we use the same methodology, and I'm going to get a model up on the screen just to really explain to you, but if we can imagine trust and rapport is about, it's really about breaking the ice and getting that ball up for the first time. Then what you're really doing is the second step is you introduce yourself, what you're there to do, and the agenda of the meeting. And now all of a sudden, the ball's a little bit higher. Now I'm going to preface and say, this is the easiest part, and by no means the part that gets the ball right up to the net, okay? The most important part, and what I would say surpasses any other step, is the probing questions, finding the unmet need. Now, we've spoken about the unmet need right through this process. No surprise here, is there? Not at all. So we're trying to find the unmet need. And what we see, if we've got the volleyball analogy, is that we've gone from maybe slightly off the ground to a little bit closer off the ground, and then all of a sudden, the ball goes straight up because all of a sudden, we're now starting to identify the unwanted, uh, sorry, the unmet need, which specifically will help us sell because then we hit the ball up a little bit higher, which is providing the solution, which is attaching the features of our product to the unmet need or their benefits as a customer and relating it to both tangible and intangible benefits for themselves. The, the intangible, obviously, would be talking about what's going to help them. The tangible would be something they can touch, feel, or taste, okay, something that they're going to be able to experience, i.e., I can save you $5,000. That's intangible. That's a holiday for you and your wife to, to go on holidays. Fantastic. I can see myself going on that. Fantastic. Then what we do is we introduce the trial close and the asking for the sale. Now, that is the part where after all of the features and benefits, we're now at the top and that's the smack down. Now, that is the easiest part of the sale. If you know what you're doing and if you've done all of the other steps, there should be no uncomfortability there because all of a sudden, the ball is high enough for it to be spiked. But if you can imagine doing it from anywhere lower, the sales process, it, it seems you like it's a the ball into the net, basically. Exactly right. Now, yeah. going back to... I guess new salespeople or people that don't have that experience, I constantly see them jump around the sales process. There's no set, when I say process, I use that wrongly, there is no process. They leave out key details. Um, they, and as a consequence of leaving out key details and failing to show the benefits, I mean, people tend to, and it shocks me constantly, but people tend to talk about the brochures. They're brochure salesperson. So they'll hold it out and they'll say, so this is one feature we have, this is one feature they have, this is one feature that we have. And as a consequence, it's, they, don't, they have to push the sale. They have to force the closing because they haven't followed through with the process. The ball's halfway up and you're doing a Hail Mary spike or a Hail Mary pass to try and get a victory here. And can I make a point, Matt? The worst thing that can happen to a salesperson, I think, is that by using this ad hoc approach is that if they do get a, a victory early, that let's say for whatever reason someone just happens to like the product and they buy it, 
that person's got a false hope that, oh, well, this is the way to do it then. Yep. Whereas they got that sale in spite of themselves. Exactly right. right? And everybody gets a lucky shot. Yeah. Exactly right. And I mean, again, I know I try to, I, I continually use this analogy, but again, imagine a person trying to perform surgery with no process, no system. Mm. It would be uncomfortable for them too. Yeah. So everything is uncomfortable without, uh, without experience. Everything is uncomfortable without a process. And we do things that are uncomfortable until we get the systems and the experience together yes. to be able to do it where we're comfortable with that process. Yeah. And again, we're going to step back to the, vo um, the volleyball analogy, and I'm going to pull this other image on the screen because I want you to really visualize how most people are trying to sell these days and understand how not ridiculous it is, but uneducated it is on and why it seems to go wrong. Because realistically, we spend 30 seconds breaking the ice. And then all of a sudden, once as soon as we've broken the ice, we're trying to hit the ball straight to talk about features of our product. Yeah. Right? Now we're talking about features of the product. The ball's still down here. We haven't worked out finding the unmet need. We don't know what the customer wants. We're just reading them a brochure in hopes. They go, hey, I love electricity. Or hey, yes, I was looking for education. Or yeah, you know what? I was thinking about buying a da Dell laptop next week. Right? It yeah. just doesn't happen that frequently. Yeah. And, and in fact, not, not to break your flow here, but the, the statistics are undeniable here that over 90% of all selling globally fails. And it is right there that it fails. It fails because people are trying to get up this mountain of interest where and we've explained that many times you've got to find this unmet need and through that revelation that, yes, I've got a problem, help me with it, that the interest soars, there is no interest. It's like, oh, you, you sell electricity, fantastic. I've got, uh, I've got an electric company. What do I care? It surprises me constantly. I mean, I've, I've gone to networking functions. And I go to networking function more as entertainment value or more to meet people that I can get to work with me. But when I go to networking functions, people ask me what I do. And I first say, no, let's talk about what you do. I understand what they do as a business or as a, on a personal level. I understand everything that's going on in their lives. Then I talk to them about what, what I do. But everything that I do relates back to how I can help them. Right, and that's why doing it that way really helps. When I, but when I find I ask them what they do, they go, I work in the electricity business. Okay, great. Well, I'm interested in electricity business. Well, this is our price tag. It just doesn't work as well. So as a consequence, again, you're following those steps and you're going to trust and report all the way to just talking about features and then doing this Hail Mary ask for the sale or sitting on your back hoping that the ball will fall on your hand and go over that net. And realistically, it's going under the net or going smack bang into that net unless by some lucky break, and as we said, sometimes you do get one, some miracle happens and you get sales. And the real scary thing is when that happens and verifies that for a person that they're doing the right thing in the early stages and the amount of salespeople I've trained that forget to follow the process and end up with a sale in the early ages or a few sales in the early, in the early section of, of their learning and then that verifies that they no longer need to learn strategies, learn processes. And within a very small period of time, they say, I was lucky that time, I was lucky that time, now I'm unlucky. And all of a sudden the word luck is used. And as soon as that's in there, yeah. we're done. No. It's, uh, uh, honestly, it's, it's a classic analogy that a broken clock is right twice a day. Even though it's not moving, it actually is right twice a day. Yeah. So, uh, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. And look, for me, I've never really had to push a sale, right? I've never really had to manipulate a customer. For me, sales is about going through the motions. And as long as I follow the right systems and the right procedures that I've written a long time before I got to this sale, then I just follow through the process. And next thing I know, I'm doing paperwork. And what I tend to find is that the people that compete against me, and look, I love, when I worked in telecommunications, I'd always get this person that sit down, chuffed in their chair and say, I've got another salesperson coming to talk to me. I've got 16 different brochures on here because I've had three, maybe five other salespeople in before you. What are you going to offer me? And they literally sit there and they say, what am I going to No, before I get started, I want to talk to you about what I'm going to do today. 
and then I'm going to ask you some questions so I can understand you and your business. And their whole world shatters. All of a sudden, they're relieved because I'm now talking about them. And next thing I know, I'm signing the customer up on the day when most people didn't get further than the brochure. So for me, most people would get rattled when they experience mm. the fact that a lot of salespeople have been there. I get excited because I know I'm going to sign that customer up on the day. And again, it surprises me no end, the three, five, seven years people spend learning their practical skills to become an electrician, to become a plumber, to become a neurosurgeon. Yes. And yet... And they spend years doing that. They spend five to ten years learning the stuff they need to be able to finally go out in the business for themselves. Then they may spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on advertising to get themselves in front of that market. And then they try and sell with virtually no experience whatsoever and they fall on their feet. I mean, let's use the electrician as an example. That's equivalent to a person with no skills, no experience, trying to wire a house. And when you think about it, they're wiring a house and then they flip the switch on or they start to turn the power on and sometimes out of some fluke, it will work out. But most of the time, they're gonna get zapped and if they're really unlucky, the house will burn down or the customer will kick them out of the residence going back to sales analogies. So using that analogy, what advice would you give a person that's in that position? Okay, so the first piece of advice that I'd give to people in this situation is start from the beginning. The days are gone where you can just rest on your laurels and say the customers will come to me. First thing is the market is getting much more educated, with, especially with the introduction of online facilities. They can now do all the research themselves and find out which products or services they should be buying. The salesperson these days, if they're just a brochure salesperson, then they're a conduit we can do without. It's no longer required, right? Because people can just hop online and buy it for themselves. So I, fo I like to focus people on starting from the beginning. Just like a neurosurgeon would open up a textbook and learn the steps to doing a surgery. I did an interview recently and the interviewer uh, made it, uh, said that whenever well, the person that he knew was about to go and do a new surgery, he would open up the textbook and go over the steps that were required for that surgery just to remind him of the steps that he would need to cover when he walked into the room. And that's a great analogy because when you walk into the room as a salesperson, you still have a group of steps. You still have a group of stories and processes that you need to cover before you ask that customer for a sale. So, and this is why I can't wait until the next, uh, the next session that we spend together because I'm really going to be helping you break that down into learnable chunks and help you systemize that process so once you go through it, you'll be able to ask for the sale completely with ease. We're going to be covering off on actual dialogue you can use with the customer where they will simply put their, put their hands out and say, I need your help, right? Be able to create those emotional triggers that get that customer on side where you can walk in and see five or six brochures on the, on the, on the customer's bench and smile because you know you're going to be the one to get that signature on the piece of paper. Well, Matt, i got to say that uh, this really is an exciting area because at the end of the day, and as someone who's passionate about marketing and has been for 30 years, I, I totally understand the value of marketing, but within that, it is undeniable that ultimately we have to translate that demand, that goodwill, that want for a product into a sale and clearly we're starting to make that connection here between the marketing and the sales and I can't wait for the next workshop where we're going to talk about the actual dialogue where people can go out and use it themselves that is exciting so for now uh, I want to thank everyone for being with us for this workshop and of course as always please go to danandmatt.com and always have a look at the seminars that we've got coming up and hopefully one of them will be in your neck of the woods. So until next time, thank you very much. Thank you. Today we shared with you some fantastic concepts and ideologies to help you and your business. These are the same strategies that we have used to build businesses into the multi-million dollars within such a short period of time. We've also helped other clients build thousands of customers within just periods of two to three years. 
These same concepts have also been used to help national and multinational corporations improve their bottom lines and their acquisition strategy time and time again. Mm. Now, despite that, the caveat that we very much want to give you is that obviously we don't know the subtleties and the eccentricities of your respective businesses. So as is always the case, always seek professional advice before starting a program of your own. Now, obviously, you can go and see a professional sales and marketing coach or hop on danmat.com. We have seminars that we hold all year round. Hop on there and see if there's one in your local area. We would love to help you tailor the most successful sales and marketing program to help you build your business to success.